Because we do not know when we will die, we get to think of life as an inexhaustible well. And yet everything happens only a certain number of times, and a very small number, really. How many more times will you remember a certain afternoon of your childhood? An afternoon that is so deeply a part of your being that you can't even conceive of your life without it. Perhaps four or five times more. Perhaps not even that. How many more times will you watch the full moon rise? Perhaps 20. And yet it all seems limitless. True seekers, how many years has it been since you found yourself truly watching an endless sky? Was the angle of the blade too wide that morning of the final cut? Are you still one second behind the universe after the day you no longer spoke to her? Do you wonder why the songs on the radio have lost their luster? Can you remember the last time you believed there was a world beyond the clouds of your dreams and those clouds in your coffee? There must be some way out of here, said the Joker to the thief, neither realizing that the joke had been played on all of humanity. Everybody is stuck with the things that they're not proud of. But some of us comprehend now what the joke is, and it's called our own existence. So we laugh like demons and play like children again, having caught the punchline and retrieved the pearl of great price and wisdom. And now, with the Joker and the Thief, perhaps the Walrus and the Carpenter, we sneak out of reality for a moment to spell and enter the virtual Alexandria, a pinpoint in the darkness that reveals the Pleroma, the fullness of the Divine, instead of where we spend most of our time, in an empty space filled with broken illusions called creation. A more perfect stage could not be asked for. Happy heresies, my beloved true seekers. This is Aeon Bite, formerly Coffee, Cigarettes, and Gnosis. I am, and I am Abraxas. Welcome so much to that dream of you and waking truth that we are all gods in the becoming. Our eyes open slowly, painfully, the crust of ignorance thick like the semen of a successful porn money shot. We wince at the ethereal midnight sun of Isis, but are so tired of the static night. And we see, feel, and sense like never before, once we recall our divine chromosomes and the monstrous minute that we are the Gnostics. Like the Nag Hammadi Library's treatise on resurrection says, The rich have become poor, and the kings have become overthrown. Everything is prone to change, but the world is still an illusion. Mulder, the truth is out there, but so are lies. No turning back, no backing down, ever, or on this approximately Saturday, July 26, the year of our Demiurge 2008. We rise with the breath of Sophia in the memory of Hypatia of Alexandria, beckoned by the material requiem of the Symphony of the Aeons and the call of Simon Magus, the true incarnation of the Great Power. We also stretch one hand with love and kindness to those who want to follow us, while with the other we swipe away the smoke that blinds the cosmos, coming from the nostrils of the snake-bodied, dragon-headed Jehovah. What's God? Well, you know, when you want something really bad and you close your eyes and you wish for it, God's the guy that ignores you. We multitask between breathing in the truth and farting out lies. And we won't get fooled again, my beloved true seekers. Like a great sage once said, You know, the very powerful and the very stupid have one thing in common. They don't alter their views to fit the facts. They alter the facts to fit their views. Which can be uncomfortable if you happen to be one of the facts that need altering. By the way, that was Doctor Who. The truth is found where it's found. We don't accept becoming those facts that need altering, and we certainly don't accept altered facts anymore. No more tricks. No more lies. 
only truth. Here at Aeon Bite, we see the true virgin facts, and they have been legion. We know that St. Paul was co-opted and corrupted by orthodoxy, when in reality the myth-maker belongs to the Gnostic and the mystic. We have separated fable from reality and myth from repression over and over again. We have given you the truth about the Cathars, the Sufis, the real pagan religions, the Kabbalists, the medieval occultists, the origins of many secret organizations. We have granted you an apocalypse of who were the first Christians long before Christianity. We have exposed the esoteric heart of so many giants, toyed with myriad theological theories, and stripped away the layers of orthodoxy over what once were Gnostic original writings. Sometimes you gotta run before you can walk. And we continue now with the Gospel of Mark, once again with another angle, as well as dedicate some time understanding the plight of Christianity today that has become an inch wide and a mile long, like a fading whip instead of a bulwark of comfort. And also again, how the Gnostic revival might be its one and only hope. Why don't you burn in hell? With us today to explain all of this and more is the Reverend John Killinger, a Baptist and Presbyterian preacher and author of such book as The Changing Shape of Our Salvation and Ten Things I Learned Wrong from a Conservative Church. The Good Reverend is the classic hero story of a man who began in the maws of fundamentalism and evolved into a champion of openness and compassion without the loss of intellectuality and logic. I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed us with sense, reason, and intellect has intended us to forego their use. He is a close spiritual king of the original Gnostic Hierophants, who were mystics, theologians, and philosophers, all wrapped up into one esoteric enchilada. In his many travels, from preaching in small-town churches to teaching in Ivy League schools, John Killinger has tangled with many giant fundamentalists, including Jerry Falwell, and recently shook the Baptist world with a workshop at a conference where he taught how, well, how the Gospel of Mark was Gnostic and how the divinity of Jesus should be questioned. Just uh, Google John Killinger with Baptist Convention and you'll find copious Baptist blogs and newsletters denouncing his apostasy. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition! But Reverend Killinger, as you'll hear in the interview, is a role model for the individual who will not be silenced and will continue fighting for what is the truth no matter how much the hordes of intolerance try to marginalize and destroy him. If you get a chance or 20, Go to his homepage, johnkillinger.cam, for more information on his liberal and liberating views, my beloved true seekers. Don't act like you're not impressed. Although it's generally accepted, even by many conservative theologians, that the Gospel of John was originally a Gnostic sacred writing, the Gospel of Mark being Gnostic is relatively new. In Aeon Bite number 87, Back when the show was called Coffee, Cigarettes, and Nooses, Stephen Hewler put forth a great case for Marcion being the author of the Gospel of Mark. After all, Marcion really means Little Mark, and that's just the beginning of Stephen's case. I may sound like a lunatic, but I'm not crazy. Furthermore, other radical scholars have proposed that the Gnostic sage Basilides might have had his hand in Alexandria in crafting the Gospel of Mark. After all, according to one church father, Basilides is reported to be one of the first people who believe in the adoptionistic theology, which means that the character of Jesus didn't begin the cosmic Christ until the divine entered him when being baptized in the Jordan by none other than John the Baptizer. I'm not the Messiah! And that's really the first theme of Mark's Gospel which the Gospel of Luke and Matthew try to wash over with their own Catholicized and Jewish Christian proclivities. Although tradition states that Mark was the secretary of Peter the Rockhead, that makes no sense because in his Gospel it's obvious that Jesus can barely stand Peter. In fact, Jesus can barely stand the rest of the disciples, a foreshadowing that another apostle would have to come later and clean up their mess. And that was, as some Gnostics believe, the true paraclete of the Gospel of John, Paul of Tarsus, 
aka Simon Magus, aka Marcion of Sinope, and perhaps aka Apollonus of Tyana. Download the programs on all these cats and verify how all arcane roads lead back to the original teachings of the myth maker, as the great Talmudic scholar Chaim Macomb called him in his book by the same name. Sell crazy someplace else. We're all stocked up here. So what I'm basically crowing about throughout all my drivel is that it's time we, the Gnostics, got our material back from orthodoxy. Give us the unedited letters of St. Paul, the Gospel of John and Mark, the Gnostic ideas of being one with God in the epistles of John, and even large sections of the Old Testament dealing with Sophia and the mystical messianic principle. Keep the rest for now, and we'll give you parts of the Nag Hammadi library that are not Gnostic. Does the expression, no man is an island, ring any bells? Does the expression, shut your ass up, ring any bells? And again, I repeat that the Reverend John Killinger will also deal with the dire importance of the redemption and reformation of mainstream Christianity, whose many ideas have jumped the shark. With the help of the Gnostic spirit that has always been available in the intellectual and spiritual subways of society. As you will see, Christiana is indeed going through an identity crisis, from the top to the bottom, but many of you already know this from headlines, your own churches or ex-churches, and even personal revelations. I keep trying to remind myself that when Jesus shuts a door, he opens a window. Yeah, so we have something we can jump out of. For another hortatory show dealing with what needs to be done to save Christianity from itself, in these rising days of fundamentalism, you can download Aeon Bite number 70 with Tom Harper, author of The Pagan Christ in Water into Wine. And hopefully one day we'll get the great Bishop Sponge at the virtual Alexandria. Hopefully. In the meantime, sit back, light up some tobacco substance, incense, or some witch candles. Make sure you've got some fuel in your cup because coffee is for closers and fire is the devil's only friend. Like John McClain sang, we fight the good fight, keep the faith, and cross the finish line. The real war hasn't even begun yet, although the spiritual war has raged since the divine went crazy and created all these crazy gods in their empty bottle of coke because it lost its female principle. We must be prepared because one thing history hasn't lied about is that they'll eventually come after the meek, the mystic, the free thinker, the truth seeker, and, most of all, the Gnostic. There are, of course, those who do not want us to speak. Reverend John Killinger on the Gnostic Gospel of Mark and what kind of metaphysical defibrillator Christianity requires. But before, a little inspiration from the Corpus Hermeticum, before we forget the importance of the pagan Gnostics. This is him to Gnosis. The Gnosis of God has become to us, and at its coming, ignorance has been driven out. Truth has come to us, and with it has followed the good, with life and light. No longer has there come upon us the torment of darkness. They have flown away with rushing wings. Thus has the mind been made up in us, and by its coming to be we have been given sight. Whoever then has by God's mercy attained to his divine birth, abandoned bodily sense. He knows himself to be comprised of powers of good, and knowing we rejoice. God has made me a new being, and I perceive things now not with bodily eyesight, but with the working of mind. Being born again, I see holy things by seeing things holy. Now that I see in mind, I see myself to be the all. I am in heaven and in earth, in water and in air. I am in beasts and plants. I am a babe in the womb. I am the one who is not yet conceived, and the one that has been born. I am present everywhere. This is Rebirth. Hello and goodbye as always. This is the Aeon Byte interview. Today we have the pleasure and honor of having uh, Dr. John Killinger with us to discuss an assortment of uh, topics. Uh, how are you doing today, John? I'm great, thanks. Well, thank you for coming on the show. I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, why don't we get started? How did you come to your realization that the Gospel of Mark is a Gnostic work, and what is your evidence for this? 
on that topic, uh, and that again is a, that's a rather a radical thing. And I have a book on the subject that's uh, making the rounds of the publishers right now. It hasn't found a home yet, but it started uh, oh seven, eight, nine years ago when I was invited to give the annual biblical lectures at the uh, National Association of Congregational Christian Churches when it was meeting out in Des Moines. Uh, they, uh, because it was meeting in the uh, in the heart of America and one of the great farm states, the program designers uh, designed their three-day program to uh, follow a format. The first day was going to be plowing the field, the second day was going to be planting the seed, and the third day was going to be reaping the harvest. And they asked if I could do biblical studies that would sort of uh, comport well with that arrangement. Uh, as I was doing my research uh, in the New Testament, uh, one of the things I found was that there's very little interest in plowing, I think, because in ancient Israel there just wasn't a whole lot of plowing to start with. Uh, secondly, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, talk about reaping. There were a few passages about the harvest being ripe and ready for reaping and so forth, but there were a lot of passages about seeds. And uh, I found that many of these congregated in the fourth chapter of Mark. And I was sort of curious about that. In fact, I was curious about Mark's uh, whole logic and the way he had arranged his stories. When I went to a seminary, and ever since, in all the books I've read about Mark, Mark has been regarded as the naive gospel, the one that doesn't have any particular plan or anything. It's almost as if... Uh, he is thought of as being the original reporter who just sort of wrote down what he knew about Jesus and that then Matthew and Luke and others who came along arranged his material plus other material to make their Gospels. But one of the things that uh, I discovered interestingly in the fourth chapter of Gospel was that uh, there were three tiny, almost seemingly insignificant parables about the kingdom of God all in a row uh, the first one was that the kingdom is like a uh, lamp that is set on a stand and gives light to the whole room, which, you know, is not a very meaty parable. It's a nice image, but not a very meaty parable, nothing like the uh, parable of the prodigal son, for example. Then the next uh, uh, parable of the kingdom was that the kingdom is uh, like a field that a man sowed, and he went to bed, and he got up, and he went to bed, and got up, and Mark's way of saying time passed. And uh, then one day, the field was green all over. Then uh, the third parable was the parable of the mustard seed, which is more familiar, uh, that the kingdom is like a tiny mustard seed, which when it grows up becomes a great plant in, in which all the birds of the air can come and take refuge. You know, I didn't think too much about finding this little cluster of parables. I thought, well, you just dump these in more or less. And then the next story in Mark's Gospel is about uh, uh, Jesus calming the sea. Uh, he was out in the boat with the disciples. A great storm came up. They woke him up because they thought he didn't care what was happening to them and said, Master, don't you care that we're perishing? And Jesus uh, awoke, calmed the sea. The Bible says it was dead calm then, which is an interesting expression, and just like a sea of glass almost. And Jesus chided the disciples for not having any faith. Then I noticed that there were three meaty stories after that. This time, not parables this time, but very lengthy stories uh, for the Gospels. The one about the uh, Gerasene demoniac or the uh, sort of madman that Jesus and his disciples encountered, whose life Jesus turned around by casting out his demons into the swine that ran into the sea followed by, well, he starts to tell the story of the uh, daughter of Jairus, a, uh, a synagogue leader uh, who came to Jesus because his daughter was ill. He starts to tell that story, and then in what is a favorite fictional technique in Mark, uh, or narrative technique, interrupts it with a woman uh, who reaches out in the crowd and touches Jesus' garment, and she's had, for years, has had this problem with an unrestrained menstrual flow, uh, which not only has been worrisome to her from her, the standpoint of her health, but in the Jewish culture has made her uh, a, uh, a forbidden person at the, uh, at the synagogue or the temple. She 
was considered cursed and could not come into the confines of the holy. And she touches Jesus and is instantly healed. And then Mark resumes what started to be the second story and ends up being the third story about the little girl who was ill but has died now. And Jesus goes on to heal her, raise her up from the dead. And uh, I thought, you know, what's, what's going on here? Why three of these insignificant stories, then the story of Jesus in the sea, and then these three lengthy stories about people. And suddenly it occurred to me as I looked at them that there was one commonality to all of them, and that is that each of the seven stories, and you, anytime you see seven in any kind of Jewish or Christian writing, you've got the feeling that you're on to something because in Hebrew numerology that meant fullness. When you look at those stories, each one of them was the story of a dramatic transformation. I mean, that was the key that linked them together. The three little parables about the kingdom, each involved something changing dramatically. A light being put in a dark room so that it gives it light. A field that was brown and dark suddenly springing up with grass or see whatever was planted in it, corn or wheat or something. And then you had this tiny little seed that springs up into a great bush where all the birds can light. Transformation. Then the story of Jesus and the disciples in the sea. Uh, that's a story of transformation. Their condition went from being highly imperiled to suddenly being totally safe. And then you've got these three lives dramatically changed by Jesus. And in the last case, uh, the most dramatic of all, a young woman being raised back to life when she was dead. And I thought, you know, Mark did have a pattern here. What's the pattern? And then I went back to an earlier story about the seeds. At the very beginning of the fourth chapter of Mark, Jesus talks about uh, the kinds of soil. He's telling the disciples that some of what they do is going to catch uh, root and grow, and some of it won't. And he gives the parable of the soils. Uh, the seed will fall on rocky soil, or it will fall on a path where people have walked, or some of it will fall on good soil. And uh, it kind of sets the stage for all of these stories of transformation. And then at the end, there's yet another story, only this is real-time stuff, where Jesus goes back to his hometown and is more or less rejected by the people because they know him and they don't believe in his power. And it says he could do no mighty works there because of this. And I began thinking you know, about numbers here, nine of them. There are nine candles in the uh, menorah. Was, did Mark have a, something in mind here, an image of a Jewish menorah? Whether he did or not, the stories really are still kind of orderly. Then I raised the question, what about the calming of the sea? What's that about? I thought about the fact that Mark does not have a bona fide resurrection story at the end of the gospel the way the others do. If you pick up the Bible and look at it, you'll see a story there or two because uh, some scribe came along later and added it because he didn't think the uh, gospel was complete the way the others were. But scholars can tell from the language and everything that uh, this was not by Mark's hand, it was by somebody else. So what was Mark doing? And it occurred to me that what he really was doing was putting his resurrection story back in the middle, putting it in the middle of all these other stories and showing how the resurrection of Jesus transformed everything, both in the inanimate world, all those little parables, and in the, in the animate or human world, all those great big, big stories. So I worked from that. I, I found other textual patterns in the book as well. But, uh, uh, in fact, there's another story uh, that I think is a resurrection story a couple of chapters later where, again, the disciples are in peril on the sea. This time Jesus is up on a mountain praying, and he comes in the middle of the night walking to them on the water, and they are afraid. They think it's a ghost, which, again, is a signal that's a resurrection story. He's a resurrected being. In John's Gospel, uh, the disciples won't recognize him at first when he comes in their midst because they're surprised to see this man who's been crucified. But uh, here he comes and frightens them as a ghost. And uh, he says, uh, uh, lift up your hearts, don't be afraid, it is I. Lift up your hearts or don't be afraid uh, is a phrase in the ancient liturgy, sorsum corda, lift up your hearts. 
and the it is I uh, in Greek uh, are the words ego me. It is I or I am, and there are many of these I am sayings in the John's Gospel. It is I. These are the very same words in the Greek that appear in the uh, Greek rendering of the Old Testament for God's statement to Moses when Moses said uh, on being sent to Pharaoh, who shall I tell Pharaoh has sent me? Uh, God says uh, to Moses, uh, ego in me, I am who I am, or uh, I am I, it is I. So Jesus is using the same words there that God used to Moses in the Old Testament. My, my conclusion is that, you know, there's something really strong at work here. Uh, you have to connect this with what you know about Gnosticism. Gnosticism, number one, was very widespread in the early church. Mark himself is thought to have gone back to Alexandria, where he was from, after the death of, of uh, Simon Peter in Rome. Alexandria was really kind of a center of Gnosticism in those days. Uh, the Gnostic Christians were considered just as good as any other Christians. They just happened to be a little different, a little more eccentric in the things they believed. Nobody had become orthodox at this point. And one of the tenets of Gnostic Christianity was that they did not like to deal with the whole question of the physical resurrection of Jesus. They were very much into the spiritual enlightenment that came through the presence of Jesus who had been, in some mystical sense, raised from the dead. So you've got a mystical or spiritual resurrection in Mark's Gospel as opposed to a more physical one that's shown in the other Gospels. It also accounts for, it answers uh, some other things about the Gospel of Mark that interpreters have wondered about for years, such as why were the disciples in Mark's Gospel so utterly stupid and blind? They were <laughs> Very true. Being, <laughs> they were always being chided by Jesus in that gospel. Why were women accorded such a great status in the gospel of Mark? Uh, why did Jesus, when he healed somebody, say, don't tell anybody, you know, keep this secret. Uh, go your way, but don't reveal this to people. Well, the answers all have to do with Gnosticism. Uh, in Gnosticism, everybody was stupid or blind who hadn't yet reached enlightenment. Uh, which came when the mystery of what they were dealing with was fully revealed to them. In Gnosticism, there were women priests. Uh, they had a very high status in Gnosticism. Uh, and uh, also, uh, in terms of the uh, keeping things secret, uh, Jesus told them, don't tell anybody. That's exactly what the adherents of Gnostic cults were told. It was an importation from the Greek mystery religions that took place in secret. They went through their rites, whatever their rites happened to be, and they kept those very secret, sort of like Masonic rites today or something like that. So all of these characteristics of Gnosticism are really embodied in Mark's Gospel. But at some point, you know, when the canon was first put together up at the, toward the end of the second century, uh, they must not have realized that it belonged to a strain of Christianity that had been classified as heretical by the Orthodox Church. And uh, I, I think it's time for us to uncover that and get back to what may be the truth about this gospel, and it will help us if we do that. I'm not a biblical scholar myself. I know a few things about it. But I think the real scholars need to go back and look at all the Gospels in light of this and re-examine the patterns of how early Christianity spread and how varied it was in its many, in its many manifestations around the Christian world. John, do you see any more uh, flares of Gnosticism in the canonical Bible? Well, uh, you know, except that it protests against it so strongly, I think I'd see it uh, certainly in the Gospel of John. There is a strong emphasis on enlightenment there, on uh, seeing the mystery of beholding God's incarnation uh, in uh, this human being. But uh, John also, uh, at the same time that it may have been designed to appeal to Gnostics, uh, is very careful to emphasize the carnality of Jesus, the absolute humanity of Jesus, uh, for example, it's John's Gospel that talks about uh, uh, Jesus thirsting on the cross. 
Uh, that story doesn't appear in the other Gospels, but John wants to underline the fact that this was a human Jesus who was dying. And uh, then uh, when Jesus uh, uh, presents himself to the apostles after he's been crucified, uh, he shows them his, uh, the scars in his hands and his, uh, and his side uh, as uh, evidence that he really was crucified. So John goes to great lengths to point that out. I, I'm not enough of a scholar about these things to say any more about that, but I, I don't have any doubt that Mark is through and through a Gnostic gospel and that it needs to be restudied in the light of what we now know about Gnosticism, partly through documents that go back and study the phenomenon in the ancient world, and partly through the so-called gospels and apocryphal writings that were discovered at Nagamadi uh, in the 1940s that constitute the so-called Nagamadi library that we have. And moving on, uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, new book, The Changing Shape of Salvation. Well, uh, in a way, they're related. I'll tie that up in a minute. But I wrote that book, uh, The Changing Shape of Our Salvation, uh, for Crossroad Publishing Company uh, here in New York, uh, which used to be the old Herder and Herder, a Catholic uh, press that became more ecumenical under its present CEO, whose name is Gwendolyn Herder. Uh, the editor uh, of uh, Crossroad uh, at that time was Roy Carlisle. That was a couple of three years ago. And Roy envisioned uh, a new study of salvation done by both Catholics and Protestants. And he asked me to write the Protestant version of it. And he approached several Catholic scholars about writing uh, their side of it. Uh, I think uh, between you and me, I think, and whoever else listens in on this, I think that uh, uh, a lot of Catholic scholars uh, felt a lot of trepidation about doing this because the present pope uh, was Cardinal Ratzinger, who was head of the uh, College of Faith, or whatever it's called, in Rome, that studied what was orthodox for the uh, Roman Church. And I suspect that they didn't want to get into a sticky wicket uh, with him or anybody else right. in Rome. I was a lot freer to do what I had to do. But uh, uh, so I took this on as kind of a challenge to write it. And I was doing more or less what I think was uh, uh, just a kind of contemporary update of uh, what used to be called a uh, Heidelskischik, the, the history of salvation. Uh, the latest one uh, that I remembered uh, reading was back in the 50s, the 1950s, by a Baptist scholar, an English Baptist scholar named Eric Rust. It was simply called Salvation History. And uh, so what I was doing was going back and looking at the ideas of salvation or redemption in the Old Testament and then bringing it up, looking at them in the so-called intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New, and then how uh, salvation was treated in the New Testament and some of the history of it as uh, it moved out of the New Testament era into the Middle Ages, where it got pretty much rigidified into the uh, whole theology of the sacraments, the seven sacraments of the Roman Church, which were almost universally in Christianity considered the way to reach redemption or salvation. And in the midst of writing this, I was uh, uh, speaking at a conference uh, down in uh, Columbia, South Carolina, uh, for a couple of days to a group of, uh, oddly enough, of, uh, of Baptists. These were part of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. Uh, they were ministers and counselors, most of them associated with hospitals in the Columbia area, talking about uh, uh, preaching and pastoral care and things that were more uh, akin to where they were working. And at the end of the day, uh, the last time we met together, we had a little time left over, and I wanted to kind of get their soundings on what I was working on. And I asked them, this group of pastors now, and these were Baptists, admittedly more progressive than the so-called Southern Baptist Convention, which uh, they came out of. But uh, I expected rather an orthodox answer from them when I said, uh, what do you people believe about Salvation Day. What does it mean to you to be saved today? I was astounded to hear them, almost every one of them, respond by saying that to me, salvation is in terms 
of self-fulfillment and enlightenment and discovery. Uh, and they weren't talking about being saved from hell or anything, you know, the old orthodox answers about salvation. And uh, I asked, I said, well, what do you think about the afterlife? Oh, we believe there's an afterlife. We're just not sure what it's like. And over and over again, this was their story, that they no longer looked at salvation in the same orthodox manner that people did for years and years and years. So as I probed them, both individually and collectively, uh, I got the idea that I've got to go home and do some more research on how people really look at it today. So I emailed and wrote snail mail letters to ministers and lay people that I knew all over the country and asked them, what do you feel about salvation today? And again, I was surprised to find that, and it may reflect in part the people I know, but I was surprised to find that working pastors, uh, everyday Christians who were members of their churches across the country, all came back with this unified response that salvation to them now means some kind of uh, self-fulfillment, of, of reaching the best they can reach as human beings under God, and that it includes openness to others, uh, inclusiveness. Uh, none of them wanted to rule out the possibility that there will be Jews and Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims in the afterlife with them. Uh, to them, this all belonged to God. And while I was writing all of this up, trying to fit it into uh, the more recent developments in salvation history, John Meacham came out, who at that time was the religion editor of Newsweek. He's since become the general editor. Uh, John Meacham had this magnificent interview with Billy Graham. Uh, had a picture of the old lion of evangelism on the cover, uh, looking pensive in his log home down in North Carolina. And in this interview, I was amazed to see that John Meacham got Billy Graham, who for many years was kind of the, uh, the image of the conservative Christian evangelist in the world. He got him to admit, number one, that he didn't believe every jot and tittle of the Bible as being the word of God. Wow. And number two, that there might be Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims in heaven, that that was up to God, it wasn't up to him. This was a startling revelation from a man who all those years had been citing uh, John's Gospel where it says that uh, Jesus is the only way to salvation. Whoever doesn't believe in him will not uh, make it, you know. This, to me, was great news, and uh, uh, it, it signaled... Christianity is really coming of age uh, in a new world culture. And this is where it sort of ties in, if you don't mind my going on. You, if you, no, you want me to ahead. stop? No, okay. go ahead. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, this John. is where it ties in with my interest in the Gospel of Mark. Because I believe that the one great impediment to interfaith discussions today is probably the physical resurrection of Jesus, or the uh, special kind of divine lordship that, of Jesus that this confers upon Jesus. The talks uh, among Christians with Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims and others, uh, the talks always break down at this point. They cannot follow there. If Christianity claims an exclusive lordship for Jesus, there isn't any room for them unless they become Christians. On the other hand, if early Christianity, particularly Gnostic Christianity, did not have this wall of separation from other faiths, if it did not see Jesus as being physically raised, but as somehow being an angel of God, a spirit of God, uh, the resurrected one who came as a messenger from God, if they saw it in this way, then people in other faiths would be able to understand and come closer to Christianity than they have been able to come for centuries. So I think all of these things are conspiring together. We're moving into this electronic culture 
which is as different for our era as the uh, print medium was uh, at the time of the Reformation and the Renaissance. The Reformation, all of our Protestantism, would not have been possible without uh, the invention of the printing press that made it possible, number one, to print Bibles in the vernacular for people in all countries and put it in the hands of anybody who could read. And number two, it made possible the printing of tractates and commentaries and other biblical supports that were used then by all the denominations as they came into being. Now we are at a new cultural moment in the history of the world when the electronic uh, culture is changing things drastically for us and changing our way of understanding things drastically. And if these new insights about salvation and the Bible and all the others come together, it's going to give us the freedom we need uh, to unsettle Christianity again, to get it beyond the gelled orthodoxy it had assumed into a, a place where the other religions can understand it better and we can have greater dialogue and everything can work differently. Reading some of your uh, works, you say that, uh, again, bringing up about God, but that we should move away from Jesus being God incarnate? Personally, uh, I, this is where I have moved. Uh, I don't advocate that others have to do this. I, I realize that it's a central tenet of faith uh, to many Orthodox Christians, and I don't want to make them too uncomfortable. Um, but I will say that in my own study of the Scripture, my own personal devotional life, uh, for a long time now, uh, I pray to God, I don't pray to Jesus. Uh, I may end a prayer in Jesus' name because I think uh, Jesus taught his disciples to pray that way. Well, he was a rabbi. Uh, this was the way rabbis uh, instructed their disciples to pray. Uh, you know, put their imprimatur on what the disciple prayed and that sort of thing. Uh, I think we, all I'm saying is we've got a lot of restudying to do and rethinking to do. Uh, that we cannot take the old orthodoxies into the future with us and expect them to work properly as tools of evangelism and so forth. We have got to come unstuck in order to unstick others in the dialogue. I had lunch today with uh, two people, very scintillating lunch for a couple of hours. Uh, one of them is, uh, persons was Bob Chase, who is the director of Intersections, a, a new, relatively new organization uh, seeking global justice. Uh, he's working on conferences around the world with world leaders, with great theologians and others, uh, trying to uh, uh, advance the cause of world peace and justice. The other person was a woman named Esley Hughes, who was a high-level banking official in New York, uh, one of the uh, highest ranking women in that uh, industry that has been predominantly male at the top. Uh, and Esley and Bob and I were talking about uh, the need in, in modern uh, social and political structures to bring economics and religion back together. Uh, the, the economic forces in this world are the driving forces, and the church maybe sadly to say for some people, the church is no longer as central as it once was. Culturally, it has been demoted to a marginal position. Now, one reason for that is that the church uh, has not continued to produce uh, people uh, in the various industries of the world who were theologically informed. Uh, these people often, I think someone said at lunch that the uh, the church fears the economic world, and the economic world ignores the church. Uh, that's putting it very simply, but there's a lot of truth in that. And we were talking about ways in which to generate new discussions about where the world is today economically and what Christians must do, as well as people of other faiths, to change the whole climate of human life in the world. Uh, to bring peace and justice in the world and to care for the people who are starving in Africa or uh, for uh, 
uh, people who are being shut out for uh, gender reasons or people who are overlooked because they happen to be a small group like like Native Americans. Bob Chase is uh, very concerned about the fact that there are about 90,000 Native Americans living in New York City. Uh, it is the largest group of, uh, of Native Americans anywhere in the world, anywhere in the United States, and they're right in the middle of the metropolis of New York, wow. and they're being overlooked as a social group. Uh, they, they do not receive the kind of justice uh, politically and economically that they should be receiving as the original owners of this country. But there are so many of these inequities in the world, and the church was not addressing this. I mean, you get a, an occasional letter from the Pope at the end of the year or something like that, and this or that Christian council will come up with some sort of uh, tepid statement that usually is uh, not very good because it's a committee product, and it's hard to have committee products that have a lot of strength in them. But uh, we haven't made any impact religiously on this new new world culture and we've got to adjust ourselves to be part of that dialogue again and get back in the middle of things with uh, our message about God and love and care uh, and be effective in the world and we won't do it until we look at the way our culture has changed and realize that faith always is influenced by culture, accept that fact, get over it, and go on and be willing to make the kinds of mental compromises we may have to make in order uh, really to be the body of Christ in the world today. Another thing that sets you apart from Orthodox Christian and a very hot topic view uh, or issue right now is homosexuality. How do you view homosexuality? I sat by a homosexual, a gay man, uh, in church Sunday morning. I wasn't preaching Sunday at Marble. I sat by a gay man. My wife, on the other side of me, was sitting by another gay man. Uh, these are friends and fellow church members at Marble Church. One of the things I like about this particular church is its openness uh, to people who have uh, different gender ideas than some of the orthodox ones that have come down in the church. Bob Chase was telling us at lunch that uh, his organi organization, Intersections, has been sending out a questionnaire to six, I think he said 6,000 Protestant ministers across the country to find out their attitudes toward homosexuality and to see if there's a correlation between their attitudes and the fact that the church in general across the states has done so little to make a climate of acceptance for homosexuals. They got back 3,000 responses, which was a very high number of responses. Anytime you give 50% uh, response to a questionnaire, you're doing exceptionally well, as you know. They were right in what they had assumed, and that was that the ministers themselves weren't quite sure. Uh, they feel as if they've been doing a balancing act in their congregations trying on one hand to talk about God's love for everybody, including the homosexual community, and on the other hand, uh, trying to keep peace with uh, Orthodox Christians, uh, those who are slow to accept the fact that these people are part of the fabric of our society. So the church has not been leading on this issue. Only in a few communities and a few churches in those communities has it been leading. Uh, again, my position is that uh, all of these people are God's children. We don't make the rules about how our brains are wired for uh, one kind of sexuality or another. Uh, we may be on a particular side of the fence, and we may or may not be happy with the way we are. Part of what we've got to come to is an acceptance of the fact that people are different, that we live in a very varied culture and society, and that the culture itself is ahead of our religion in many ways. Our religion is uh, being put to shame for its lack of care and concern, not just in sexuality, but in other areas as well, because we just don't do the job of loving the world with the way we're supposed to. And uh, so, you know, if you, if you want to ask me some more questions about that, I'll be glad to carry it further. 
but many of my good friends are homosexuals, and I'm pleased that, uh, at least in metropolitan areas, they are able to live openly now uh, the kind of sexual lives that they are equipped to live. Uh, I mean, it's not mine to legislate whether they're right or wrong. I don't think it ever has been the providence of the province of religion to do that, uh, even though uh, in most uh, older cultures, uh, religions did act in that way. And how do, so basically, uh, any of the uh, deleterious passages in the Bible against homosexuality or whatnot, you <laughs> yeah, see it simply as a culture of the time, yes, exactly. not as something that we should be dealing with in the 21st century. Right. These were cultural uh, conditions uh, at the time. Uh, most of the cultural prohibitions, most of the religious prohibitions in the Bible against homosexuality are found in the book of Leviticus. But uh, as Mel White and other leaders in the uh, gay world uh, have said from time to time to the uh, orthodox religious leaders, okay, uh, are you going to follow this rule? about stoning your children, if your children uh, speak back to you, uh, are you going to uh, uh, stone your wife uh, for committing adultery or an indiscretion of some kind? If you're going to take part of that uh, cultural uh, overlay uh, of religion seriously, then you have to take it all seriously. I quite agree with the logic of that position. And I think uh, it's time for us to move beyond the prejudice uh, that has been built into so much religion, we've got to re-examine almost everything. Most Christians don't want to do this. Uh, the average lay person is loath to investigate any kind of question like this, uh, and, and because it threatens when you start reinvestigating, uh, it implies that you have to be very serious about what you're doing and that you may run into dangerous territory in doing it. And yet, this has always been the province of religion, to be dangerous. When Moses went up into the mountains uh, to speak with God, there was thunder and lightning around him. And it was as if, you know, he was entering a sacred ground where a man could be struck dead, which uh, in more than one time in the Old Testament, people were struck dead. And occasionally in the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts were struck dead, supposedly, for lying to the disciples about uh, how much of their income they'd given into the communist uh, uh, treasuries of the early church. <laughs> uh, but the, the people are, are really reluctant to enter any kind of conversation or dialogue where they are threatened in their traditional positions. And yet, this is what religion's about. It's about being willing to go into the heart of things, into the uh, inner sanctum where there is danger. You remember that uh, in, in the ancient days in Israel, in the days of the, of the temple in Jerusalem, that the high priest went into the Holy of Holies only once a year on the day of Yom Kippur, and that when he did, uh, he uh, had a rope tied around his ankle so that if he were struck dead, uh, in the Holy of Holies, they could pull him out, and he wouldn't contaminate the Holy of Holies very long. <laughs> very true. And and that image of the of the sacredness of the uh, of the space we're entering when we get into these dialogues uh, is, is very real today, and people shy away from it. But there ought to be a call from the high places in Christianity and other religions to enter that enter that arena and take that risk in order to uh, forge a uh, religion that is proper for this new era in which we live. Yeah, very well said. Uh, but what about Paul? Do you see Paul, when he talks about homosexuality, as simply being a man of his times? Yes, I uh, do. Drawing upon Jewish culture? Right. Paul uh, certainly was a Jew of the Jews. He'd been raised uh, in the law. He said that, you know, uh, he... And uh, if anybody was a uh, Pharisee, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Uh, this was his background. He would have instinctively been revolted by the idea of, uh, of homosexuality, which he would have associated with pagan courts, uh, with mystery religions and so forth. Uh, he would have seen that as anathema to who he was. 
And personally, uh, I think we need to look at a lot of the things Paul did with a circumspect eye. Uh, he certainly was a major force in the spread of Christianity in the ancient world. But what was the Christianity that he spread? Was it the religion of Jesus? I, I, I often ask myself, why, if Paul was such a follower of Jesus, do we never once hear a reference in any of his letters to one of the parables of Jesus, which were central to the teachings of the early church? Why do we not hear anything about the teachings of Jesus? We only hear about Jesus' death as this sacrificial thing, which Paul used to reach the, the Jews of his time. They came out of a sacrificial culture, and he makes Jesus, just as the book of Hebrews does, he makes Jesus this sacrifice par excellence and says to the Jews, okay, your sacrificial system has come to its climax now in Jesus. Here, here's the one. Maybe that was all right in one sense. It was marketing, and it was shrewd marketing, and it won the, won the way for early Christianity. But what was the price that was paid for that? Did it lose something of the mystique of Jesus himself, the freedom, the radicality of this man who was the leader of the early Christian church? Did it, uh, uh, did it make Christianity itself orthodox? in a way that Jesus would have repudiated. Uh, to me, Jesus uh, was a rebel, and, and I want to keep that figure of the divine rebel uh, because this is the only way I can get beyond the smallness of all these orthodoxies into the vastness of the religious arena where we need to be today. Well, John, I think uh, that's about all the time we have today. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for coming on Aeon Byte and uh, bringing, us, uh, bringing us some more of that alternative Christianity that the Gnostics did 2,000 years ago. Well, I appreciate the chance to talk to you. And I'm sorry if I sounded like a preacher. I get excited. Oh, no, no. Wonderful stuff. <laughs> but thank you, every, thank you very much, and uh, have yourself a good day. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.